What's going on, people? Welcome to the match preview show. The Palace are back. Another international break over. And this time, there is nowhere to hide as we haven't got another one till March. And we've got some big games coming up. Of course, I'm joined by Nick and AJ here to preview the Villa game. And it is going to be interesting. We'll be talking about player selections as well as Wilfred Zaha. He's been mentioned. However, will we take him back? Should we take him back? Or has time passed by? As always, make sure to get involved by leaving down your thoughts in the comment section down below and dropping a like and subscribing to the show if you are new. Gents, it feels like a while since I've done a show. Maybe with AJ, I know it's been a while for you as well. Nick, you've done the latest preview. How are we feeling now that Palace are back this weekend? Are we excited? Is it like, oh, Palace are back? <laughs> I'm, uh, I feel rested from not really watching football, which has been nice. Mm. And I've actually had weekends where... I've done stuff with with the missus and just had a whole weekend free. It's been so, so nice. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I'm not really looking forward to um, to Palace coming back, although they always surprise us. So um, yeah. let, let's hope it, it Saturday will be the start of something great and we go on a mad run. But who knows with this crazy football team of ours. Yes, crazy. I think that's the right word to use when describing Palace, AJ, because the last international break, when we did come back, it was against Forest on Monday night, and I was excited. Um, a few other fans were probably excited as well. You know, oh, it's time to... We've had our break, and Palace are back. However, the game didn't go well in terms of, like, results-wise. It didn't go well, but even in terms of performance. And in this game, there's massive question marks over injuries, which we'll be talking about. But in general... Is there any signs of optimism that you can take forward to this game? Or does it just depend on who is available? Um, I mean, against a team like Aston Villa, it brings me more nerves, I'll be honest. I, I feel like we're going to go back to stress toxic very quickly, to be fair. I'm not really anticipating anything against them. Plus, we haven't really had any sort of certified yeses in terms of the players coming back into the team. We know they are due to come back, but... I know a lot of them aren't. Nobody's really come out and said anything, to be fair. We haven't really had much Palace news during the international break. Um, there's been a few ru silly rumours, but nothing really going on. So um, against a team like Villa with a full-strength side that we've got now would have been an issue. Against a full-strength Villa side with the players that we potentially may not have available does kind of make me a bit, little bit nervous. I, I, I can't lie. Um, very similar to Nick, it's been nice not having to worry about um, <laughs> Palace and, uh, you know, the, the missus has kept me busy with uh, decorating and uh, stuff that uh, relation, that couples do, should I say. But um, it would be nice to actually have go back to a bit of football for a while. Uh, no international break to cut that off because as much as it is stressful, it is what I enjoy. Um, so <laughs> I'm not getting my hopes up for this weekend. But I'm hoping that we can at least get some kind of momentum or just at least get the performance back up to scratch and then sort of try and build something because it has to be now or never. If we're serious about, you know, realistically staying in the league and realistically getting some points together and get pushed up the table, it has to start with Saturday. So, fingers crossed. You probably you missed You're going, Nick. You, you said a full-strength Villa squad. I was having a look at their, their local news and whatever. Um, some of their players are coming back, but their defence looks very weak with players out in defence. So, you know, I don't think any team we, we play against is going to be full strength, to be honest. with you. If you look at the amount of injuries there are for every mm. team, it's it's affecting everyone. Yeah, our, our injuries, though, it is concerning. And look, we did face Villa recently <laughs> and we beat them at their ground. Um, of course, that wasn't a fully strength uh, Villa side. Of course, they did make rotations, so I do understand that. And um, we did go pretty strong in that game. Um, and in that game, funny enough, we've, we suffered two injuries, um, Eze and Walton, and it led to Walton having that surgery. Um, and then Eze is still out. But look, I think this, from here till January, it all depends on if players come back. The squad is extremely thin in terms of well, it was against Fulham anyways, in terms of injuries and uh, fitness issues. And we just need everyone fit to have a chance, especially going forward, because we just don't have enough attackers. That's the reality of the situation. However, 
the reason why it's not all dull going into this game, well, anyways, if this is if this is the case, Will Hughes should be back. So when we're looking at the midfield, um, there should be an improvement there. Decore has had extra rest um, over the international break, so hopefully he should be fit to start. And Adam Walton, when he has surgery, he is expected to come back around potentially this game. Um, Due to when he had the surgery, I mean, it's been it's going to be two weeks for the international break. Then, you know, he's been out for around three three weeks. To, to... Yeah, they said four weeks, didn't they? Mm, yeah, so it's, it's, it should be very close. It should be very close. So it, it all depends on if. But should... based on that, D, just on that point, what I don't want to do is I don't want us to be in that situation, which I don't think Galarzna would do. But I don't want us to rush him back. Yeah, we what, like they they say. It makes the most logical sense for them. I mean, the whole point was we were making him play through the injury originally. Uh, and obviously, he was not up to par and up to scratch. And, you know, he's not even in... Well, we, we know how quality he is. And obviously, he is getting a few plaudits here and there. But we know how important he is to us. So I would rather sacrifice him in the next game or so to make sure he's 100% fit. So when the running starts kicking in nearer to the Christmas period, which is hectic, and he's better 100 percent fitness. I think I'd rather just take the risk with that in terms yeah. of water. I agree. I agree. And I hope we'll make the right decision as well. Because not only Walton, but Eze, because there were talks over the international break about Eze, he could potentially play for this game. If not, he should be fit for Newcastle. If if there is a potential they could play for this game and we're looking at oh, should he play? Should he not? Don't play. Like genuinely don't play him. It I know it's easy for us to say right now, and then come Saturday. For the match reaction show, we'll all be complaining, saying, look at the attack. We had nothing there, no creativity, etc. But we don't have another international break till March. We've, yeah. this, this was the final one. We have to be smart about the decisions that we take with players injured. Villa away from home is not going to be easy, but there's also a chance that if you do play like <laughs> uh, or Walton, that you still don't win that game and you risk injuries. I, ra I would rather... I think Walton, by the way, is going to be a massive plus massive plus because we haven't seen the real Adam Walton this season. We saw him last season, but we haven't seen him so far this season because he simply hasn't been a hundred percent fit all throughout the season. And in fact, I think it's hurt us a lot, especially in that two man midfield at times when we've continued to play Walton when he wasn't fit enough. However, Will Hughes, he should be fit. The Corey should be fit now. And I feel like when you look at the performances from the Spurs game onwards, I know the Wolves game was a bit, annoying because we scored two goals, considered two sloppy goals. The Fulham game was a write-off, to be fair. I would have done any anything to take a draw. We had 14 first-team uh, players fit. Um, but slowly, I think if we do get the players back and if they are 100% fit, even though the running is going to be hard after Villa, I think we can still pick up results, potentially. Because I don't want us to be in a case, and that's why I'm looking at the Villa game, and we'll talk about predictions, but I'm more thinking of let's try to get something out of this game, like at least something to build on it. And then the following week, if players are not fit and then they do come back, then, you know, we, we've got more, you know, more first team players to take on Newcastle, for example. But this game is kind of important for momentum because that Fulham game, Nick, I don't know about you. It was, I mean, up until Lacroix's injury, it wasn't bad. But then after that, you just had nothing. But then you look at the squad, you look at the bench, who on earth are you bringing on? Yeah, it just seemed to fall apart, didn't it? Just just to go back to the, the bringing players back too early. I'm still annoyed when Elise came on against Brighton. Was it oh, no, was when we were 4-0 down? That was shocking. And I just hope that that is still ringing around the club because mm. I know it's a different manager. But, yeah, the, the bench needs to be stronger. Um, what's his face? Got his uh, Northern Ireland call up, didn't Justin he? Justin Devenny. Yeah. Justin Devenny got a few minutes, so that's a positive. Gay played really well, I've heard, for the England games. I didn't actually watch them. Um, was Did Gay um, get an assist for Gallagher? I, heard. I, didn't, I don't know. I didn't watch England. Yeah, yeah. So, that's uh, what I said on the internet, but I'm, I'm, I'm with you guys. Uh, I can't remember the last time I watched England, probably during the net last international tournament, whenever that was. Was yeah. that this summer? Yeah, so... I think, yeah. I think you know what it is? I don't know. Of course, those who are watching, let us know in the comment section down below if you do watch England play. But just in general, with international football, when your club football is as bad as it is right now, the fact that Sam Marino has got more wins in recent times than Crystal Palace, um, 
which shows everything about it. You just want to cut off like football. I think that that is the reason why I was looking forward to, to forward to the international break. Not because I mean injuries play a massive part because it gives us extra time to get these players, you know, more fit and available. But yeah, you just switch off. You just naturally switch off um, when when Palace and perform. Yeah, well, Will, Will went. Will went to the that? Ireland game. My son mm. Will. And he asked me if I wanted to go, and I just thought, no. I, well, A, Wembley is a nightmare to get to. Well, it isn't. It's just, it, North London is a nightmare to get to. Um, and I can't be doing with a sodding band all the time. Um, I can't be doing with the jingoism. If it was a World Cup match or a European Championship match, yeah, definitely I'd go. Mm. I mean, not even a qualifier I'm not bothered for. Um, it just doesn't do it for me, the international yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just get disappointed by watching Turkey play. Um, that's my international break. Um, apart from that, I think that's that more than enough. I don't watch any other um, games. Turkey, games. What and I know you'll, you'll probably do a news show about this at some point. Um, mm. I saw Galatasaray and um, Tyreek Mitchell linked because Tyreek Tyreek Mitchell, uh, yeah, because his contract's out at the end of next week. Uh, next year, next week, <laughs> next, yeah, year. next season. <laughs> uh, so yeah, apparently Galatasaray, in, according to a couple of the sources from news now, he, well, he, he signed an extension that didn't get well. It didn't get announced by the club, but Matt Wasn't uh, did oh, mention right. it. So his contract is not running out um, at the end of the season, as some people thought it would. But then talking about Tyrod Mitchell, let's quickly talk about performances. Rumours, there was rumour over the international break that, you know, in, in the January window, um, we will be looking at left uh, wing back position to strengthen. And there has been a lot of lot of eyes on Mitchell, but, you know, we've been struggling to score goals. How much do we think that Mitchell has played a part to that? Because for me, yes, there has been limitations to his game. And eventually we do need to sign a left wing back. I thought we, we should have signed one in the summer. And when we had opportunity, because I, it, it's the similar thing that we've gone through with the right back situation, even before Glasner joined the football club, where it took how long to sign Munoz because we said we had Nathaniel Klein and Joel Ward there as two right backs. Like we just with the, with the wide positions, especially in defence, we just don't do well in terms of recruitment. So far, anyway, we just take ages. So Mitchell, I mean, there's lots of eyes on him. Is it an urgent position that we need to strengthen? Yes and no. Um, there's a few positions in the team that I think needs addressing. Uh, obviously, I've read the report. Was it Edmund Brack, uh, Buck that yes. put, put the report out about obviously the, the you know looking to strengthen in January? I'm not a fan of it. I feel like it should have been done in the summer, uh, like probably most fans. For I think we left the manager way too short, and obviously we we are paying the consequences for that. Um, there are names that obviously naturally you'll have in your head, you know, but, you know, when you're playing FIFA and football manager in real life, those are very different animals. So the thing is, we definitely need depth there because I think the, the reality is, I think for any competitive football club, especially at a level like ours is, if you don't have somebody that is ready and willing to replace you and give you something to worry about at elite level sport, you're, you're comfortable. You get too comfortable. That is the same walk. That have that walk. That works every walk of life. If you are in a job and you're in this, you're cons- you you and you make yourself indispensable in the sense that there's nobody that can really do what you do. Jeff and Schlupp, really Sorry, I'm laughing. Jeff Schlupp's supposed to be able to play there, so he's, he's even less worried at losing his place. I will. I will <laughs> remain fair. silent. I'm not going to respond. AJ can respond to that if he, if he wants to. But the fact that he hasn't... Well, how many games has he played this season, Jeff Schlupp? Schlupp. I mean, the, yeah. the reality of Schlupp is, the, you know, Jeffrey Schlupp's a Premier League winner. So, <laughs> what, what a crazy world we live in. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, he's the only Premier League player, player winner in the, champ, in, the, in the Palace squad. So, you know, yeah, what Jeffrey time Schlupp has had a more successful career than... Basically, everyone I've had this right. I mean, he's all right. Henderson let must have won something, surely. Conveniently, let this one sink in. Jeffrey Schlupp has had a more successful career than Wilfred Zaha. Yeah, no, he has. Uh, well, he has. Yeah. On paper, 
Zaha won over Zaha won over in Turkey though. <laughs> what, what do you say? The Turkish league of Premier League. D, D. The fact that you even you as a Turkish man are saying that know that, that you are waffling on a high level. <laughs> you are waffling at an elite level. That is diabolical. That's a diabolical statement. But um just just thinking about the fact we're talking about Jeff Slup and he's in the squad. Do you remember at the beginning of the season we didn't buy him any we, we were pleased that we got the early transfer stuff in with Canada, weren't we? And, or whatever and then we had some coming late and it was reported that Glasner was happy with having not so many sort of integrated Premier League players in that squad um mm. and relying on youngsters and it's come to bite them on the arse because it's the play key players that have got get, got injured yeah and, and I think recruitment in general and I was, I, I've been thinking about this for a few weeks as well even like going into this game, I'm, I'm looking at some of the plays that are available and looking at the injuries. And, and I mean, on deadline day, we were happy. Like we were, we weren't furious. But I think in hindsight, when you're looking at some of the attacking options that we've got, we're just missing that number 10. We're missing that number 10 um, down the right-hand side. For me, when Saar did join, I did think it would be an IU... So I think, the, okay, I don't want to talk about Kamada too much, but when Saar did join, I did think he would be the IU replacement. Um, saying that, the IU replacement, where IU would play out wide in general for Palace, not as like a number 10, um, we don't even play that type of formation. So I thought, you know, Saar could be an option up front because he's strong, he's fast, and I think Laza could uh, convert him to striker. I think the biggest problem that we've had so far is Kamada signing at the time was like, wow. Like, you know, we got Elise still at the football club. We signed Kamada. So if Elise goes out injured, then we have Kamada as a backup number 10 option. The problem is we sold Elise and we tried to replace him with three players. It just hasn't worked. It just hasn't worked. And I think that is one of the consequences that we are paying right now. And I do think without everyone being 100% fit, it will be a struggle till January. And in January, they will end up spending money. I'm, I'm so convinced of that. I've been critical of the board, but I, I just know how they are. We saw last January, Munoz and Adam Walton. Why? Because there was, a full, there, there was a possibility of us going down. So when there is a possibility of Palace going down, they will spend. Like, they will spend to make sure that does not happen. And the sad this, reality this, is, it's like, why this is what I'm fed up with. The and uh, the thing is, right? Do we want to keep doing this forever? Like, where is the level of progression? Every season, we are literally going around in circles. Like, mm. uh, the same, the same quotes. It's the same anger. It's the same backlash. It's the same, you know, pattern. It's like, don't spend the money unless it's absolutely necessary. When things are, you know, when we're against the grain, make changes either in management and then bring in three or four of their players. And that can go far as back as, I mean, that could go way, way back, depending on how far you want to go. But I mean, the most common one Premier League wise is, I think of Sam Allardyce. When Sam Allardyce came through the door, he brought through, what, three, four of his players? January, yeah. And then that was it. And, you know, things started working. We went through full swing and cycle. We've done it with Pardew. We've done it with... Holloway, even the year we got promoted, uh, you know, he brought in his own set of players, which I'll be honest, barring the Kevin Phillips. Well, actually, do you know what? Even with the Kevin Phillips, if we weren't for the penalty, would we be sort of looking in it in that same light? Mm. It's just it's the same cycle, and we're not seeing any levels of pro pro progression. And I'm almost tired of almost having this conversation. Maybe this is for another show on another day, but you look at your ball moves, you look at your villas. West Ham, uh, Fulham. Remember, in that time span we've been in the Premier League, most of those teams have managed to either have a season in Europe, drop into the Championship, get promoted again, progress as a football club, sometimes go back into Europe and then overtake and take off in the sunset. And we're just sitting there stagnant. We are the new Coventry City. They were there for years and years and years, Coventry. Just like mm. we are at the moment. Not doing yeah. that. The next, the next no, one's up, well. like it's going to be Fulham. You got to look at Bournemouth now. Bournemouth look good. Is there a conversation there to be had? Like, what what is going on? Like, we are not money progressing on any level. 
Yeah. Well, Nick, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that about money, right? And I, I do agree to an extent. Naturally, money does always accumulate, uh, traditionally will accumulate to success. But then Burnley had a season in Europe. You know, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. You know, um, the yeah, likes of I West Ham think... went down. Newcastle went down before the Saudi money came and managed to get themselves promoted back up. What they did was obviously they lost a lot of big boy names and then they bought, they built a championship elite team, brought themselves back into the Premier League and then slowly started progressing. Naturally, the Saudi thing came in and saved them. Leicester, Leicester won a Premier League, got relegated, came back. Now they're perform, outperforming us. It's mm. just the same cycle I'm seeing and it does really irk me sometimes, to be fair, because it's like there is just nothing to hold on to or there's nothing to sit there and make me think. You could, you know, I do understand. I do understand, understand color, you know, I am very appreciative of the fact that we are a Premier League team. I get to go week in, week out and watch Premier League teams um, come to sell us and see the best of the best in terms of what the Premier League has got to offer. But there are just some times where it just gets above the levels of frustrating. And I'm, you know, I'm going into my workplace environment and I've got Bournemouth fans bantering me. A Bournemouth fan is bantering me. It doesn't even make sense in my brain, but it's the reality of the situation where, where we are. You know, the the Fulham game just before the international break, I didn't even stay for the whole game. I literally, by that the, by the time the red card happened and the second goal went in, that was the first time I've walked out of Sellers Park possibly ever unless there was obviously an emergency or whatever but you know i as soon as that second goal went in i rushed out the stadium i jumped on the 75 and i went on like it's it's frustrating and it's just i cannot be the only fan that feels this way it just can't no, be. no 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 you're not you're not a lot of people are are saying the same thing as well and i think it does come down to well look in the summer we started well with kamada and, and I'm talking about timings and, you know, Chad and Riyadh. We started, like, I was like, what's going on? This ain't the Palace that we know. Like, signings before we even start pre-season. And then it kind of kicked in. The reality kicked in. In terms of, you know, signing those few players and then waiting until deadline day to bring in the other players, etc. And not only just that, it's just like who we brought in. I think Enketia still... I don't think he's a terrible player. I truly don't. Um, and he has shown glimpses of him being well, but then again, he's been playing out of position. Then he's to put context onto that. I think a lot of problems have recently, and it is, and I do have to say it here with Kamada, uh, because after the Fulham game, I, I saw um, Palace announce it, that there were racism towards Kamada, which it absolutely baffles me because regardless of, how bad he plays he's like one of us like why do you need to go to that extent but with the Kamada situation for example I'll be honest I I don't know of course he's not playing in this game but that's why it's good that hopefully players should be coming back after the international break and we'll see where Eze is at but I don't know how he reco- how he recovers uh, honestly I'm at that point I don't know how he you recovers because on that point right of the Kamada thing right and the Rakamada incident, people are entitled to, whether it be politically, belief-wise or whatever, have their own beliefs. They're, you know, everybody's their own individual and stuff like that. People come from different walks of life. But in that example, do you actually know what football club you support? Do you actually know where you are? Like, let's even take the Crystal Palace. Let's... Let's take Sellers Park and take it out of there. As a fan of Crystal Palace Football Club, when you come to Selhurst, do you actually know where you are? Do you actually know the surroundings you are? Do you know what kind of community you're surrounded by? I would grow up in a very multicultural community in South London. We never had those kind of setups where I grew up. You know, we as far as I was concerned, I was always educated. You treat people based on, you know, how they treat you. Yeah, and, back and you are welcome. You know, I don't want to turn it into some big, you know, political, you know, anti-racism tirade. But with that in mind, I literally cannot fathom why anyone would not even just take the risk. Why anyone would even come to the mindset 
of coming to a place like Sellers Park, Crystal Palace, South London, and behave that way. The next time you go to Sellers Park, and this is to any fan, when you are walking off, whether you're getting off a bus, you're walking, you're driving, and you are walking up to that stadium, and you are in the stadium, and you are supporting it, and you're cheering, you're booing, and you're doing whatever, take a fucking look around around what's around you and the kind of people in the different walks of life that they come from. Because that is just outrageous and never okay. Yeah, yeah. We are a multicultural club. We are in a very affluent area in the terms of multiculturalism, not even just London, South London as well. You couldn't get away with doing that on the street nowadays. What makes you think you can do that at a football, pet, uh, football stadium? And I'll yeah. be the first to put my hands up. If somebody did that around me, there would be a problem. Yeah, Connor. I saw it. So when where so where I was sat at Holmesdale, I I was shocked, but I saw pe- a few people waving him off. But I didn't hear or see anything like racist, so I didn't know what was going on. I don't know where it happened, but I just saw people waving him off. But at that point, when I saw people waving off Kamada, in my head, literally, I thought, yeah, this is done with Kamada. It's done because let's be real, we've been in this game for far too long to know how it's going to end up. It's like he can have one good game or he can have to, like, straight away have two bad games on the back of that and everyone will be on him. I just don't see it working. I, maybe it's the expectations with Kamada and the, the amount of games that he's played and him being Glazer's player and he's an experienced player. But I just don't see it working. I'll be honest. I Hopefully I'm proven wrong. But he's going to have to do like, he's, it's going to be a miracle at this point. Of course, he's out for the Villa game, which doesn't, well, I guess it doesn't help. He scored, scored, scored first against him last time. I mean, the only one of the folks that scored against Villa is, is not in the game, and Ezra might not be in the game either. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, let's go to the next point. Can I just come to Commander's defence a little bit? Because yeah. I think there are, I think there's a lot of stuff taken out of context, and when things aren't going wrong, a lot of people tend to point to the individual or the the odd one out. Is he not our second top scorer in this season? Am I am I going crazy? I don't, know. Two or three goals? I don't even know. I don't think the bar is high, to be fair. Um, no, but you see what I'm saying? Like the man does score goals. He is pro he is putting out production. Yes, it's a physical league, and yes, he's adjusting to it. He was in the middle of we what a lot of people aren't understanding with him is the manager wanted him. He was about to sign a deal with Lazio and he was wanted by a few clubs around Europe at the time. Henceforth, why, going to your earlier point, the, it was considered a massive coup when we signed Kamada because it was yeah, like, free. Raw, like, we have signed a, a guy here that is a Europa League winner. He's done bits in all sorts of leagues all, all around Europe. Why are we just, we can see that physically he's having a few issues. And obviously between the language barrier and the speed of and the intensity of the Premier League, He's struggling to adjust, but he is still turning up a few numbers here and there. Why are we not allowing him that time to uh, get into things? Granted, because, the first game, mm. I was not happy with him. I, I 100% agree. I was actually rattled when he got sent off. And I was pissed at him, which instinctively as a football football player, sorry, as a football fan of a football uh, football club, football players go through that phase. But why are we scapegoating him to try and make him like the reason why everything's failing this season? I don't get it. We understand he's not everybody should understand. There's 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 always a player, exactly. As Nick is saying, there's always a player in terms of like that's going to be scapegoated. But I think with Kamada, like I yeah, it 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 hasn't worked out so far. But I think the reason why people are on him so much is because of, or because of some of the stuff that you've listed. Like, he has won Europa League. He has done well over in Europe. He's got experience. He's not a young player. If he was a young player, people might say, all right, cool, let's give him a bit of time. But he's experienced. Like, he's got experience. And it's not the fact that he's having bad games. I'll be honest. Like, I want to be brutally honest. I'm not going to even lie. He's having terrible games. There's games where I'm watching him and he can't make a pass. Like it, it, everything, everything seems like a struggle, and I understand the frustrations where everyone's coming from because I was on the same mindset as well. But I'll be honest with Kamada. I know we spoke about we, this is like more of like a therapy session rather than oh, add us back international break. What's on our minds than actual preview about Villa? But um, but with Kamada, it 
it's yeah it's it's reached a point where i just he is low in confidence and i just don't see it working i just don't see it working i think glasner hasn't helped him i'll be honest there glasner hasn't helped the situation by playing him in midfield in a two-man midfield he's been very stubborn there at times um then again in the fulham game who do you really play when you have no one available so yeah it just hasn't been great but let's quickly talk about the lineup and then score predictions before we wrap up um sorry if we've gone a bit left and right <laughs> um and drifted away from the villa game but yeah i mean it was it was a good catch-up it was a good catch-up so with the lineup i think it's going to be straightforward if you disagree with me uh jump in um henderson and goal we have lacroix gay and chalaba as a back three uh mitchell left wing back Munoz right wing back midfield i think hughes comes back in and the Corey starts. That's my optimism. So I think the midfield is stronger from the Fulham game. And in attack, Mateta up front. And then this way it this way it gets injuries. And with the creative players. Sa does he start again? I guess so. Because Kamada ain't yeah, there. Yeah. I mean, who else do you play there? And then down the left. Who plays there if it ain't Eze? And I have a feeling it's going to be Eze because, as, as far as I understand, isn't Enketi you're injured as well? Yeah, I didn't. Even, I haven't even seen. So I think he's probably going to have to put Eze there. I, you know what? Yeah, I think he'll put. Eze well, what if he's not 100? percent We spoke about that. This then... is the struggle. This, this is this is the problem that we have right now. Yes, injuries are a problem, but it's that. It's the creativity in the side, and we just haven't even having Saar there. Let's be honest, Saar hasn't had great few games for Palace. I wanted him to start, but he hasn't had the same impact of him starting as he did against um, coming off the bench. Because even against Wolves, he should have scored a hat trick, and against Fulham, he done nothing as well. So he's been struggling, and we just don't have creative options there, Nick. To be fair, I don't know what you think about our options, but Schlup is the name that's coming to my head. Yeah. I mean, you have a Schlup and Saar. Teta attack if Eze ain't fit, but that's why he might be forced to play Eze. Well, look, definitely came in because we had no no um midfield no, options. Midfield yeah, midfield. So have we got that could do the wing from from the U for the under twenty. What was that? Agbonone. Or um, I'm, I'm missing another one. There was another young player. Put, uh. No, Corp is a right back. The yeah, exactly. Is yeah. Ag Agbanone is the main one, to be fair. He would he would come in. But then again, I don't really see Agbanone getting a start over Jeffrey Schlupp. Or he shifts Munoz. He did it in the in the Fulham game. He oh, shifts yeah. more advanced. And then he will put either Klein or Ward in the defense. I don't know if I'm a fan of that, you know. I don't know how you don't feel towards it. Desperate times, isn't it? Yeah, but I, I feel like he's banking on Munoz being that presser off the ball as the main thing and it's like an attack is we just don't have the creativity but look it is going to be a struggle let us know in the comment section down below who you play as a two number tens he might be forced to play as a because of the the situation that we're facing but midfield we should be stronger score predictions i'm going to start it off with i'm just praying for a point another game one all um we have beaten them in the cup but they should be stronger. I know they might have picked up a few injuries during the international break as well, but it's not going to be easy. Hopefully, I'm not going to get my hopes high because of what happened in the last international break against Forex, but hopefully a few players should be feeling a bit better. Um, as we've discussed today, we don't know who those are and we kick on, but I'll take a point. One all, Nick. Glasgow has been given the backing of the board, so 3-1 Villa. AJ? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go a bit more realistic. I think it's going to be 2-0 Villa. But I will take a performance. If I see things that we can build on, then mm. I've just got to be realistic. I think Villa's squad depth is just way too strong. Even with injuries, their squad is very, very good. Yeah, yeah. And and there is there's a problem. There's a problem because on the opposite side with Palace that it's not our squad depth but look if you have enjoyed the show please leave a like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below there's more shows coming out as we build up to the Villa game um, that's it from AJ Nick and I and until next time up the Palace